Herman Melville's Moby Dick is sometimes considered the great American novel. It's often riveting action scenes, its labyrinth structure, its Shakespearean dialogue, and characterizations, these make Moby Dick a world of kaleidoscopic complexity, purportedly an adventure story about a young man seeking his fortune abroad a doomed whaling vessel, Moby Dick is actually an investigation into the human nature of man god and nature itself. Ahab, the fiery captain of the Pequod, is one of the most iconic characters in all of literature, a god-seeking man wronged by nature, determined to pierce through the veil of base reality and get to the deeper meaning. Is Moby Dick about the dangers of monomaniacal leadership, the evils of religious fervor, the tragedy of being human, or all of these? Subscribe and click the bell for more high quality living, elegant style, and the monthly classics book club. Give this a like and stay until the end, you'll discover the struggles of man, whether they are external and or internal, along with more insights on its nuances. Here's a quick and easy short biography of Herman Melville. Herman Melville was born in New York, August 1st, 1819. His father was an importer and merchant, and Melville's early childhood was unimpeded by poverty. His father, Alan, described Herman as backward in speech and somewhat slow in comprehension, but both solid and profound, where he did understand. By the time his father's death in 1832, the family's fortunes had waned. To help the family financially, Melville began clerking at a bank. Meanwhile, he studied classic literature in school and in 1839 at the age of 20, and at his now bankrupt older brother's behest, Melville signed aboard as a cabin boy for a merchant ship, the St. Lawrence. This was to be only the first of Melville's voyages. His journeys to the South Seas made far more of an impression on him than his first voyage. He learned a love for the native people, including the Taipis or Tipis, who would become the chief subject of his first widely, wildly successful novel, Taipi. Taipi or Tipi? If you're familiar, let me know in the phonetics in the comments below. Published in 1846 about his experiences in French Polynesia. The glare of his harsh judgment fell mostly on so-called civilized people who targeted the so-called savages. They, the natives, esteem us, with rare exceptions, such as some of uh, missionaries, the most barbarous, treacherous, irreligious, and devilish creatures on the earth. This may of course be a mere prejudice of those unlettered savages, for have not our traders always treated them with brotherly affection? Who has ever heard of a vessel sustaining the honor of a Christian flag and the spirit of Christian gospel by opening its batteries in discriminate massacre upon some poor little village on the seaside, splattering the torn bamboo huts with blood and brains of women and children defenseless and innocent. And aside, it's easy to stand on moral high ground today in a rich country, here in the United States for instance, with zero exposure to differing socioeconomic conditions of varying developing nations if you have not traveled to those corners of the earth. Colonization exists still today all over the world and there is too long a list of things that are good and bad for it to be labeled as black or white. I'm determined to see this story from an objective perspective. I'm not saying this to be controversial. And this happened with every religion at some point in time and for multiple purposes across cultures. For example, Christians wanted to discover trade routes, commit crusades, and proselytize. They came across cultures that had different beliefs. Columbus, for example, an Italian, told the Spanish he sailed with, don't be cruel to these people, to the Caribs, in reference to visiting the Caribbean. The Spanish, the richest empire at the time met the Aztecs who were sacrificing babies, women, and all sorts of virgins to Huitzilpochtli, the god with warlike aspects. I wonder if Aztec has some sort of triconsonantal roots similar to Semitic languages. Let me know in the comments below if you are familiar. Same with the Caribs who were cannibals, and that is where the word cannibal derives. The Spanish wanted to convert them and save their souls, so they would stop innocent people. I could go on with other examples with the Taliban today of recruiting younger brothers, men for righteous purpose, giving them steady jobs and a wife. In Afghanistan, the whole family saves up for the eldest son to purchase a wife to carry on the bloodline, which is very expensive. The younger brothers have to work for the rest of their lives and not be married because they cannot afford a wife. Uh, this is why the Taliban is good to them, if you see it from that perspective. And you'll find similarity in medieval Portugal. The younger brothers went on missions to places like China and India. Kashmir, stop! Sorry. <laughs> Mel Melville concluded that the result of civilization at the Sandwich Islands and elsewhere is found productive to the civilizers, destructive to the civilizers. More of Melville's seafaring adventures, including involvement in a failed mutiny, found their way into the second novel, Omu, published in 1847. That same year, Melville married Elizabeth Shaw, a member of a prominent 
Massachusetts family. He wrote more books over the succeeding years, but his larger development as an author was shaped more by review of Shakespeare and his profound, uh, excuse me, and his newfound friendship with Nathaniel Hawthorne, author of The Scarlet Letter. Hello, friend. In 1851, <laughs> Melville published Moby Dick. Melville truly labored on Moby Dick. He wrote to author Richard Henry Dana Jr. that the book would be a strange sort of book. Poetry runs as hard as sap from frozen maple tree, and to cook the thing up, one must needs throw in a little fancy, which from the nature of the thing must be ungainly as the gambles of the whales themselves. Yet, ow, I mean, <laughs> I mean to give the truth of the thing spite of this. The book was critical and commercial failure. In 1852, Melville published Pierre, which puzzled critics was yet another failure. The last novel Melville published was The Confidence Man in 1857, another bizarrely confusing text rife with cynicism about America. Let me know in the comments if you're familiar with any of these works. Melville spent the rest of his life writing shorter work largely uncelebrated. His last novel, Billy Budd, was completed in 1891 but wasn't published until 1924, long after his death. When he died in 1891, he died largely unnoticed. Call me Ishmael. Moby Dick has perhaps the most memorable opening line in all of literature. Call me Ishmael has been repurposed and parodied countless times, yet the main character of the book, Ishmael, is odd. Ishmael himself carries the narrative for the first 200 pages of the book, nearly disappears for the middle several hundred pages, and then reappears for the final act. His individuality merges into the character of the crew, and perhaps that's the point. Ishmael represents an individual's tendency to fall prey to the overwhelming power of common cause and charismatic leader. Ishmael begins the book as a neophyte, non whaler searching for a job. We know from the outset that his search for a job truly a search for a deeper meaning as he says, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. He attends church but he is at best an indifferent Christian. In fact, he seems to bear a downright hostility toward religion. For some unspecified reason, those same things that would have repelled most others, they were the very magnets that thus drew me. I'll try a pagan friend, thought I. Since Christian kindness has proved but hollow courtesy, Ishmael quickly embraces Queequeg despite his pagan cannibalism, observing, better to sleep with a sober cannibal than a drunken Christian. Ishmael's broad-mindedness means he can observe in Queequeg something extraordinary. There was a certain lofty bearing about the pagan, which even his uncouthness could not altogether maim. Queequeg was George Washington cannibalistically developed. In this strength of character or weakness, as the novel develops, it becomes clear that Ishmael is prepared to submerge himself into the worldviews of others. He remains perfectly sanguine about the notion of living under the rule of a captain who ain't a slave. Tell me that. Well then, however, the old sea captains may order me about, I have not the satisfaction of knowing that it's all right, that everybody else is one way or other served in much the same way. As Ishmael is socialized by the crew, he adopts their pagan philosophy. Long exile from Christendom and civilization inevitably restores a man to that condition in which God placed him. Exemple gracia, what is called savagery. Your true whale hunter is as much a savage as an Iroquois. I myself am a savage, owning no allegiance but to the king of the cannibals, and ready at any moment to rebel against him. That vulnerability to outside influence will lead him into joining Ahab's mob rather than resisting it. The Pequod is a ship of cannibals from the outset, a cannibal of a craft, and Ishmael becomes a cog in the wheel. By abandoning the Christianity of his youth and embracing a pagan set of values, not merely adopting in friendship someone of a different culture, Ishmael has opened himself wide to the seduction of other causes. The question of nature and man. In Ishmael's mind, indeed, in the minds of nearly all characters in Moby Dick, whaling represents something higher. It's not merely making a living. It's a pursuit of something more romantic, more meaningful. But what is nature? It's merely an arbitrary, mindless ubiquity surrounding us but always treating us as foreign? Or is it a representation of a higher world? Is nature random and cruel? Or does it reflect some logic and order? Are we simply passing through this world or are we embedded inextricably in it? At the very least, nature is a wonderland, dangerous and seductive. Melville's descriptions of seafaring capture the mind's eye in extraordinary fashion. There you stand, a hundred feet above silent decks striding along the deep as if the masts were gigantic stilts, while beneath you and between your legs, as it were, swim the hugest monsters of the sea, even as ships once sailed between the boots of the famous colossus at old Rodis. By the way, I have been to Rodis. Visit my Instagram and you'll see the highlights at Gia G. Dixon. You'll see the Greece highlights and Rodis is a beautiful fortress, UNESCO protected, it's an incredible landmark and you'll see live cannons that I think they still work. Some of them are broken up into pieces. It's a whole medieval world island on its own. 
still exists. It's typically a lot of scholars who study there or live there or have the privilege of working there. What gives such sites and experience true meaning, however? Here, Melville offers a multiplicity of perspectives. First, there is the religious man, representing by Father Mapple, who believes that the yoke of God lies upon mankind and that man's obligation is to fulfill his duty no matter the suffering. The question of nature is superfluous. Only God's demands matter in the end. Giving his sermon on Jonah from a pulpit carved to look like the prow of a ship, Mapple, a former whaler himself, explains the message of the biblical story. Jonah leaves all his deliverance to God, contenting himself with this, that spite of all his pains and pangs, he will still look towards his holy temple. And here, shipmates is true and faithful repentance, not clamorous for pardon, but grateful for punishment. Eternal delight and deliciousness will be his, who coming to lay him down, can say with his final breath, O Father, chiefly known to me by thy rod, mortal or immortal, here I die. I have striven to be thine, more than to be this world's or mine own. Yet this is nothing. I leave eternity to thee. For what is man that he should live out the lifetime of his God? Ishmael is less sure of God, but he is sure of the eternal nature of man. He believes that the soul of man is eternal and that material world a mere chimera. Thus, three cheers for Nantucket and come a stove boat and stove body when they will for stave my soul, Jove himself cannot. Jove is an Israeli name that derives from Jehovah. Nature is a veil through which man can glimpse something beyond. Ishmael waxes poetic upon seeing a rainbow through the misty spout of a whale. And for this I thank God, for all have doubts. Many deny, but doubts or denials, few along with them have intuitions. Doubts of all things earthly and intuitions of some things heavenly. This combination makes neither believer nor infidel, but makes a man who regards them both with equal eye. Ishmael is happy with this ignorance. He is blithe about the problems of human existence. He would prefer to act in the world rather than ponder such questions. To Ishmael, both Locke and Kant. By the way, it's pronounced Kant. Kant is a German name and I have a German loved one who went to a philosophy class. Everybody pronounced it Kant in America, where he pronounced it Kant and everybody looked at him funny. So it's actually pronounced Kant. I'm not being rude. That's actually how you say his name. To Ishmael, both Locke and Kant ought to be tossed overboard. So when on one side you hoist in Locke's head, you go over that way. But now on the other side, hoist in Kant's and you come back again, but in very poor plight. Thus, some minds forever keep trimming boat. Oh ye foolish, throw all these thunderheads overboard and then you will float light and rights. Ishmael is no man of religion or philosophy. Never look directly into human suffering, Ishmael suggests to do so brings with it madness. There is a wisdom that is woe, but there is a woe that is madness. Then there is the pure nihilism of Stubb, the ship's second mate, who never seems to worry about anything. He comforts himself with the belief that he is merely a thing of matter. To him, life is merely a joke. A laugh's the wisest, easiest answer to all that's queer. And come what will, one's comfort always left. That unfailing comfort is, it's all predestinated. For Ahab, however, all of this is far too easy. Both Father Mapple and Ishmael are far too sanguine in their willingness to ignore the realities of human pain. Stubb recognizes human pain, but obviates the reality of man's higher being. In Ahab, by contrast, we find a man who desires to gaze directly deep into the deepest and most chilling of all human problems. Ahab asks the question, Father Mapple elides and Ishmael ignores. If God stands behind nature, if there is something higher than binds the universe together, why should he allow the suffering of innocence? Where is God's justice? And if God abandons justice, why should we follow him? Ahab the prophet. We don't meet Ahab until about a quarter of the way through the novel, but we know of him from how others speak of him. We know that he went mad and supposedly recovered. We know too that he has a young wife and a son at home. He is described in colorful fashion by Captain Peleg, Israeli name by the way, one of the owners of the Pequod. He's a grand and godly godlike man. Captain Ahab doesn't speak much, but when he does speak, then you may well listen. Mark ye, be forewarned, Ahab's above the common. Ahab's been in colleges, as well as among the cannibals, been used to deeper wonders than the waves, fixed his fiery lands in mightier, stranger foes than whales. He's Ahab, boy, and Ahab of old, thou knowest, was a crowned king. Peleg is correct in his assessment. Ahab is at once the most religious man and the most pagan figure in the book. He speaks beautifully in language from the Bible or Shakespeare. He invokes God regularly and yet he acts as a pagan. He is no atheist. No, his faith is in God, a God he cannot comprehend and upon whom he wishes vengeance is ardent and passionate and unquenchable. Ahab is a man of bone and gristle and iron, 
builds like a man cut away from the stake. Why are you wet? I think he licked himself from the stake. When the fire has overrunningly wasted all the limbs without consuming them or taking away one particle from their compacted age robustness. But he is, for all of that, more human than anyone else in the narrative. He both fears death and seeks it. He fears his old age and yet defies it. He hates God and yet refuses to abandon faith in him. Ahab clearly suffers from depression brought by the loss of his leg. Yes, but of something more, his belief in divine providence smiling upon him. He cannot even smoke a pipe enjoyably. He lives in the open air, afraid to descend to his cabin. He is burdened by his physical being made strange to other members of the crew, indeed to the rest of humanity. Socially, Ahab was inaccessible. Though nominally included in the census of Christendom, he was still an alien to it. He lived in the world as the last of the grizzly bears lived and settled in Missouri, and when spring and summer had departed, that wild Logan of the woods, burying himself in the hollow of a tree, lived out the winter there, sucking his own paws, so in his inclement, howling old age, Ahab's soul shut up in the caved trunk of his body, there fed upon the sullen paws of its gloom. It's very poetic. It's precisely Ahab's outsider status that grants him his authority. His subordinates are as little children before Ahab. That and his passion, his vision, his passionate belief that there must be a meaning to things. Ahab speaks to the human heart better than Starbuck, the traditionally religious first mate, who demotes Moby Dick to the status of a dumb brute that simply smote thee from blindest instinct. Madness, to be enraged with the dumb thing. Captain Ahab seems blasphemous. No replies Ahab, the world is no mere brute force. It's a world of intent and meaning and rules and consequences. That's why Moby Dick must be destroyed, says Ahab, because the white whale's presence he speaks either a blot on justice or provides a getaway to a higher truth inaccessible by man. Hark ye yet again, the little lower layer, all visible objects man, are but as pasteboard masks, but in each event, and the living act, the undoubted deed, there. Still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of his features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's not beyond, but tis enough. He tasks me, he heaps me. I see in him outrageous strength with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate and be the white whale agent or the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me be of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it had insulted me. Ahab calls out to us because in his fiery range, he stands for his glory of mankind, mankind raging against the mere physical, against the injustice of the universe, seeking something more behind the pasteboard mask. And if Christianity will not bless his quest, perhaps paganism will. By the end of the novel, Ahab has moved squarely into the camp of the pagans, just so long as they guarantee his, him his quest. Ahoy there! Tatshego, Quiqueg, Dago! What say ye pagans? Will ye give me as much blood as will cover this barb? Egonon batizotei nomine patris sed nomine diaboli, deliriously howled Ahab. This translated from Latin means, I do not baptize you in the name of the father, but in the name of the devil. Whatever tool is at his disposal, Ahab will use to pursue the whale, as Melville writes. He piled upon the whale's white hump, the sum of all general rage and hate felt by his whole race from Adam down. And then, as if his chest had been a mortar, he burst his hot heart's chill upon it. Ahab is remorseless. Ahab is pitiless. Ahab is unrelenting. I'll chase him round good hope and round the horn and round the Norway maelstrom and round perdition's flames before I give him up. And yet, Ahab is not nearly as unrelenting as he seems. He is touched by the doubts that plague the rest of his crew. He seems to mirror Stubb when he questions his own freedom of action. Is Ahab Ahab? Is it I, God, or who that lifts this arm? But if the great sun move not himself, but is an errand boy in heaven, nor one single star can revolve, but by some invisible power, how then can this one small heart beat, this one small brain think thoughts? Unless God does that beating, does that thinking, does that living and not I. By heaven, man, we are turned around and round in this world like yonder windlass, and fate is the handspike. He is kind to Pip, a black hand-driven man, by abandonment in the midst of the ocean. Recognizing the senselessness in the universe, he is still sometimes driven by human connection. Ye believers in gods, all goodness, and in man, all ill, lo you, see the omniscient gods oblivious of suffering man and man through idiotic and knowing not what he does, yet full of the sweetest things of love and gratitude. Come, I feel prouder leading thee by black hand than though I grasped an emperor's. But in the end, Ahab cast these supposed weaknesses aside. He denies the Rachel his help in searching for a lost boy. Despite his own child at home, his personality and vanity and greatness are wrapped up in his quest, and he will not, in the end, 
be denied that quest. I now know that thy right worship is defiance, to neither love nor reverence, wilt thou be kind, and e'en for hate thou canst but kill, and all are killed. No fearless fool now fronts thee, I own thy speechlessness, placeless power, but to the last gasp of my earthquake life will dispute its unconditional, unintegral mastery in me. In the midst of the personified impersonal, a personality stands here, though but point at best, Whensoever I came, whensoever I go, yet while I earthly live, the queenly personality lives in me and feels her royal rights. Starbuck, the failed Democrat. As the crew is drawn into Ahab's monomaniacal orbit, it seems that no one can stand up to him. He preys on the greed of the crew, nailing a Spanish ounce of gold to the mast, pledging it to whichever man raises the whale. He preys too on their outsized desires for a common cause. Ishmael, who is drawn into the chase, observes, I, Ishmael, was one of that crew. My shouts had gone up with the rest. My oath had been welded with theirs, and stronger I shouted, and more did I hammer and clinch my oath because of the dread in my soul. A wild, mystical, sympathetical feeling was in me. Ahab's quenchless feud seemed mine. Most of all, Ahab preys upon the claim that all demagogues make, that he will single-handedly slay injustice and restore some sense of balance and correctness to an inscrutable universe. It's not just Ahab who fears and hates the whale. Ishmael notes that it was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me. That whiteness represents, says Ishmael, the heartless voids and immensities of the universe, and this stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation. There is such a dumb blankness full of meaning in a wide landscape of snow, a colorless all color of atheism from which we shrink. All deified nature absolutely paints like the harlots whose allurements cover nothing but the charnel house within. And when we proceed further and consider that the mystical cosmetic which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light for every remains white or colorless in itself, and if operating without medium upon matter, would touch all objects, even tulips and roses with its own blank tinge. Pondering all this, the palsied universe lies before us a leper, and all of these things, the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then at the fiery hunt? As John Updike aptly sums up, Moby Dick represents the outer blank horror of the universe is godless. Ahab promises to slay the beast, to solve the riddle, to untie the knot, but there is one man who should stand up to Ahab's tyranny, Starbuck. Starbuck is a religious man, popular with the crew, realistic and pragmatic. He's a Quaker, an earnest man, and a staid, steadfast man whose life for the most part was a telling pantomime of action and not a tame chapter of sounds. Uncommonly conscientious for a seaman and endued with a deep natural reverence, he is cautious, he is careful, he is connected to normal life, desirous of returning to his wife and child. He's a sort of model man filled with an august dignity, not the dignity of kings and robes, but that abounding dignity with has no robe investiture, that democratic dignity which on all hands radiates without ends from God himself, the great God absolute, the center and circumference of all democracy. If Ahab is a Macbeth-like figure driven toward tragic action by both fate and will, then Starbuck is like Hamlet, good man, afraid of sinning in the name of that good. He never has the strength to stand up to Ahab. Starbuck knows his own incapacity, but he cannot seem to fathom it. On the other hand, he does not understand that passion overwhelms reason. My soul is more than matched. She's overmanned, and by a madman, horrible old man, who's over him, he cries, I. He would be a democrat to all above. Look how he lords it over all below. Starbuck clearly sees in Ahab the tyrant, and yet he has not the courage to do away with that tyrant. Despite the omens, despite the certain knowledge of Ahab's madness, he does not have the stomach to do what must be done. Is heaven a murderer when its lightning strikes a would-be murderer in his bed, tindering sheets and skin together? And would I be a murderer then if, and slowly, stealthily, and half sideways looking, he placed the loaded musket's end against the door? But he cannot assassinate Ahab, his democracy and virtue stop him. He's stymied by the incompetence of mere unaided virtue or right-mindedness. Ahab, by contrast, has no such qualms. Just a few pages earlier, he threatened Starbuck at the point of a musket, exclaiming, claiming, there is one god that is lord over the earth and one captain that is lord of over the Pequod. Starbuck's tragic end is the most heartbreaking of all, for he had the principles to stop Ahab but lacked the conviction. My god, what is this that shoots through me and leaves me so deadly calm yet expectant, fixed at the top of a shutter? Future things swim before me, as in empty outlines and skeletons. All the past is somehow grown dim. Mary, girl, thou fadest in pale glories behind me. Boy, I seem to see, but thy eyes grown wondrous blue. Is my journey's end coming? Demagoguery relies in the weakness of virtuous men, Melville says, and passion will always defeat the reasonable man who hope against hope that others are as reasonable as they. Ishmael is saved by the Rachel, the same ship Ahab rejected in its search for a missing boy. If Ahab had only turned aside from his own ambition to help the Rachel, perhaps he would have lived, perhaps Queequeg would have become a king, Starbuck would have returned to Mary, Pip would have returned to sanity, perhaps everything would have been alright. Instead, only Ishmael is left to tell the tale, but what a tale it is! Ahab's cry is the cry of all mankind 
at the suffering of life. Towards thee I roll, thou all destroying but unconquering whale, to the last I grapple within thee, from hell's heart I stab at thee, for hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee, sink all coffins and hearses to one common pool, and since neither can be mine, let me then tow to pieces while still chasing thee, though tied to thee, thou damned whale. Thus I give up the spear. And it is that cry that we remember and to which we resonate. The philosophizing of Ishmael seems shallow and irresolute compared with the iron will of Ahab. When Ishmael brushes off the risks of whaling as just one iteration of the vast practical joke that is the universe, we shrug. But when Ahab speaks, we stop and listen. He thunders down to us across the centuries. His cry is the same as the cry of all thinking men across all time. Ahab's cry, as it turns out, Melville's resounding. To Melville, the struggle with that reality, the gap between God's understanding in man's resulted in torment. Nathaniel Hawthorne, the greater writer to whom Melville dedicated Moby Dick, wrote of the author, Melville, as he always does, began to reason of providence and futurity and of everything that lies beyond human ken and informed me that he had pretty much made up his mind to be annihilated. But still, he does not seem to rest in that anticipation and I think I will never rest until he gets hold of a definite belief. It's strange how he persists and has persisted ever since I knew him and probably long before in wandering to and fro over these deserts as dismal and monotonous as the sand hills amid which we were sitting. He can neither believe nor be comfortable in his unbelief, and he is too honest and courageous not to try to do one or the other. If he were a religious man, he would be one of the most truly religious and reverential. He has a very high and noble nature and better worth immortality than most of us. But the struggle is not mutually exclusive with the religious belief. In fact, it's definitionally part of religious belief. If we could understand God, we would be indistinct from him. If we were totally separated from God, he would become irrelevant. The struggle with God is a struggle in which we acknowledge our relationship with him. This idea is beautifully expressed in the biblical episode in which Jacob wrestles with an angel. It becomes clear that Jacob and the angel have wrestled to a standstill. Jacob demands a blessing. The angel responds by renaming Jacob Israel, meaning he who has struggled with God and with men and who has prevailed. In the struggle lies the faith. In the end, Ahab's cry must be met the same way Job's. Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Wilt thou even make void my judgment? Wilt thou condemn Condemn me that thou mayest be justified, cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and look upon every one that is proud and abase him. God's justice can never be understood. The pasteboard mask will always remain. We must learn to accept the reality and yet continue to struggle with it. That is what it means to be truly engaged in a world imbued with meaning. Every month, we have a new book. I have the full list of books for the year linked below so you can download it for free. You can also find the book for yourself linked below or if you already own it, wonderful. I'll have all my notes in a blog post linked below. Sometimes I like to know what happens but still go back and study such magnificent works nonetheless. These are some behemoths that you can tear into over and over and always learn something new. Subscribe and click the bell for more high quality living, elegant style, and monthly classics book club. Give this a like and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you later.